Welcome back to the show. Today we have David Grebo. He's an author and CEO at Knowledge Start. David, welcome back to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. I think we had a really good conversation last time when we kind of chatted. But maybe before we kind of get into everything that you're doing, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Well, I grew up in Manhattan, actually in the city. I was born in New York. Okay. And after that, I went to school in Harvard, okay. lived in Cambridge for uh, 25 years, and moved out to California, and that's where I am right now. I'm in San Francisco. Okay. So what did you take in university? I studied film and communications, and then I worked for a while as a narrator for WGBH. Uh, I did a lot of documentaries, and then I moved into the education space in the corporations, starting with IBM. Okay. So... Walk me through your career up until kind of what you're doing now, or at least some career highlights. Well, when I was at IBM, I was an executive, and one of the things they had me focusing on was something that was relatively new back then, which was called online learning. Okay. And it was so new that they weren't quite sure how well it was working. Okay. One of the first things I did for them was to study almost a three-quarter of a billion-dollar investment they made in online learning to find out what was working and what wasn't. And what we discovered was really interesting. We found out that oftentimes the better programs weren't the most expensive <laughs> programs with the greatest production values. They were the programs that somehow or another related to what people really needed to know and needed to know at that point in their lives. So there was a context and there was a relationship that I realized good online programs needed. I then did a study with a friend of mine, Sally Ann Moore, Sally Ann right now runs all the biggest online learning conferences in Europe. Nice. And at that point, the study, we wanted to look at what was more effective. Was it the study and the work that you did in the classroom, which was considered formal education, okay. or was it the, the studying and the work you did on your own, which was informal? And we came up with another startling conclusion, Kevin. We realized that... 80% of what people were learning at that point was informal. It was not in the classroom. And then I, I looked at it even more, and I did a research paper on what's called the Ebbinghaus factor. And the Ebbinghaus factor talks about how much we forget okay. and how soon we forget it. And Ebbinghaus actually did a really fascinating study, and he realized that within 24 to 48 hours, we can forget as much as 50% of what we've learned. Okay. Now, when you think about it, corporations spend a lot of money on your training and on your learning. You go through a classroom, whether it's online or actual, and then you come out of it and you've forgotten most of what you learned two days later. Sure. It's not a great return on investment there. Sure. So those are some of the things that led me towards wanting to know more about how people learned in organizations and how organizational learning worked, what worked, what didn't work, why it worked, when it worked, and how it worked. And that led us to the book. Okay, so you obviously just mentioned the book. So what what is the book about and why did you decide to write it? It's an interesting story. And it's also a, a long way around the barn to get to the barn door. <laughs> My co-author and I, Steve... Gil and I were blogging and we were reading each other's blogs and we realized we're, we're blogging about the same thing. And so we got in touch with one another and we said, why don't we start to co-write some of the blogs? And both our blogs had pretty large readerships. Okay. We got together, we started writing blogs and then we decided, well, let's see if we can write a book and we put a good proposal into ATD Press okay. and they loved it. Nice. And we wrote, a, we wrote a chapter, and they loved that. And the next thing they said to us, here's a contract, write the book, you guys. So what we started to do was we wanted to find organizations that were doing a great job of learning in the year 2017. Okay. That meant there were a lot of options for ways people could learn. So we started to look around the world to look at companies that had exemplar models of learning and we decided there were some benchmarks. If, for example, you had rapid time to performance, if you had low turnover, if you had no problems finding people and hiring talented people because you enabled them to grow professionally through what you offered them with regard to learning, 
if you had high employing engagement because the idea is that if you're on the job and you're learning what you need to learn and you're doing a really good job, you're going to be engaged in your work. Sure. The assumption was that if we could find all these benchmarks, then we could assume that whatever they were doing was good learning and we could then draw down and see how they were doing it. Okay. What we discovered was startling. And that was the basis for the book. What we discovered was the fact that there are two competing models of management and learning in the world right now. Okay. They're very, very different. They're distinguishable. You can look at either one and start to realize which camp it falls into, which model it is. And the model that was working the best was the model we called managing minds. Okay. And the model that was not working well was the model that we called managing hands. Okay. And we realized that w one came out of the industrial revolution when all we did was manage hands. We sure. were making things in managing hands. And it's ironic that we developed an entire school of management, all our practices and our policies and our theories during that period of 200, 250 years. Yeah. And we're still using it today. Yeah. The, the difference is that the industrial revolution is over and the good news is we won. <laughs> and what's happened is that we're right now at the very beginning of the knowledge revolution. Okay. And the companies that were doing a great job with learning were also companies that had adopted a new model of management, which, which we called managing minds. Okay. And because they were using this new model of management, what was happening in the company was dramatically different and learning almost was an unintended consequence of the fact that they were managing people differently mm -hmm. and relating to people differently and treating people differently. And that's what the book ended up being about. It ended up being about this new model of managing and learning as opposed to just trying to find a culture that we could say was a learning culture. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think that's, it's interesting because I think in a lot of cases for most people, at least in for me and the people I run into kind of in the tech space, at least the whole like nine to five kind of work day seems pretty archaic. It, is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's intriguing because when we first started to look, we looked at the obvious actors, you know, we looked in Silicon Valley, we looked at the companies that were considered high tech and progressive. And then we started finding other companies around the world. Like we found a company in the middle of the country in the Midwest called Zingerman's. It's a bakery, okay? okay. And they're managing their people in a way that we could, would consider managing minds. Okay. We look, went to England and we found a company in Wales called UKTV, which is a broadcast company, and they're managing minds. Then we found a company in France. Then we found companies all over Norway and the Scandinavian countries. Now there are countries appearing in China. What happened is that what started out looking like a trend has actually turned into what I'm thinking now is a worldwide movement of progressive management and learning. Okay. And it's companies, companies are realizing the old model of managing hands doesn't work anymore. It causes high employee turnover, difficulty finding talent. Um, people aren't engaged. You know, you read all these numbers every week. You're, you're reading reports from PwC and Deloitte and other companies saying employee engagement is at its lowest ebb ever. Right. It's at 68 percent. It's at 72 percent. That many employees are no longer engaged in their work. Burson really recently came out with a piece saying almost 67% of the workforce turns over every year. I mean, there's a tremendous churn in the workforce and low engagement, difficulty finding talent. All the benchmarks that we were looking for in great companies, we found the opposite in most other companies. The companies that are managing hands, that are treating people in, in a way that it's as if they're still working in a factory. Sure. I mean, you could be working in a bank, you could be working in any other kind of company, but if you're being managed as if you're still working with your hands and you're in the industrial revolution, it's not gonna be a very satisfying job for you. And so these new companies are, are managing people as if they are minds and they bring their minds to work every day and they have something to contribute, they can learn in the book, we make a distinction between Carol Dweck does a, a piece on the, 
on the open mindset and the growth mindset and the closed mindset. Okay. In the in the managing hands world, managers for the most part believe that people couldn't learn much. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And they couldn't be depended on for too much except what you taught them and what they were told to do. In the new environment, in the new model, where people have a kind of a growth mindset, the the conclusion is you can learn what you need to learn, whatever you need to learn it, and I assume you will learn it. And if you're part of a team, everybody's going to share that information and go forward. And that was one of the six key characteristics we talked about in the book that separates the two models of management from the old one for managing hands and the new one from managing minds. I'll give you a couple of examples. Sure. In the old model, you had a command and control structure. Okay. And that's that's because it, it was it was a model that became the default that was used in the military Companies started to pick up on it because they need to manage a lot of people, and it was the easiest, fastest way for them to do that. So you had a command and control structure where a few people at the top knew everything that was going on, and a lot of people in the rest of the organization knew a little bit. Uh, and the people at the very bottom hardly knew anything except what they were told to do. We've all experienced that. <laughs> the new model is... Instead of command and control, it's what we call collaborate and communicate. And the difference is in the new model, the company understands that if you're managing minds and everybody brings their mind to work, and if the smartest company on the block is the company that wins, then if everybody's contributing and everybody's working to learn, and if everybody's doing their best, and if everybody knows everything about what's going on, then the company is going to be like a hive. Okay, yeah, and it's going to make much better decisions. And so instead of trying to control people and command them and tell them what to do, you basically ask them to collaborate and communicate instead. In other words, you accept the fact that they're going to collaborate and talk and communicate and be on the phone and get together and work together, and that's what's going to happen. And you can, you can actually feel on a visceral level the two different models. Sure. If you walk into a command and control organization – it's very, very quiet. People aren't talking. They aren't on their phones. If they are, they're very quiet. They're in their cubicles. There's not a lot of interaction. People aren't mixing. I mean, we've all been in those environments. There's almost a, there's a sense of oppression for me at this point in my life. When I walk into those environments, I feel very oppressed and controlled. Yeah, and it's I, awkward, I think, too, right? It is. It's not only awkward, but it just makes you freeze up. It makes you feel like you can't talk and you can't raise your hand and you can't offer a suggestion in a meeting you just kind of like fill yourself into a little shoebox sure you go into a company like google for example or zingerman's or uktv in wales and the atmosphere is very different it's open it's energetic there are people all over the place they're running around they're talking i mean in some cases they're on bicycles they're on skateboards they're off into little groups here and there. They're off by themselves in little cubby holes. They're all using smartphones. They're all using laptops. They're all somehow hooked in. But the basis of what they're doing, if you strip away the external, is they're collaborating and they're communicating. Okay. And they're doing it in a way to share knowledge so that everybody gets smarter. Because in the old model of managing hands, commanding and controlling meant that knowledge was power. Right. Okay. If I knew something that you, Kevin, didn't know, that made me more powerful than you. Because if I knew something was happening next week and I could act on it faster than you could, I was more powerful. Right. Okay. Interesting. <clears throat> in the going. new model, in the new model, the idea is sharing knowledge is power. Okay. Because if everybody knows what's going on, then somebody, even if you don't think it's the person you might look at, somebody somewhere can come up with a great idea or the best solution or an answer to the problem. And so you want everybody to know what's going on all the time. And that's the big difference. Okay. So, Keep going. Well, those are just two of the characteristics. There's, there's others, too. For example, tied back into this idea of what it feels like when you go into these two environments – in the managing hands environment, the old managing hands model, where there's lots of command and control and the knowledge is considered power, 
you find that people have what we call workspaces. And workspaces are very carefully defined little boxes that you live in. Now, the little box could be in the cubicle farm. And we all know what a cubicle farm looks like. Little box could be your offices around the perimeter with the doors closed. It's still a little box. People live and work in little boxes. Now, that's a workspace. The other model, in the managing minds model, people are in what we call learning spaces. They're open. They force you to interact. They force you to communicate and collaborate with one another because they look forward to what what a lot of these companies like Google, for example, call serendipitous meetings. Yeah. In other words, Kevin, if you have an idea and you're working on a project and you're walking down the hall thinking about it, and I have ideas and I'm working on my project and I'm walking down the hall, and you and I somehow you know, sit together or bump into each other or share lunch or whatever, and you start talking about a problem you have, I may have a solution. Sure. And normally, if we were compartmentalized, you'd never talk to me. You'd never bring me your problem because you'd consider it separate and need to be controlled. In this new environment, we share everything. Okay. There's some things called open book management. Zingerman's in the Midwest practices open book management. Open book management is a way that everybody knows what the financials of the company are at any given moment. Now, a lot of people can't do that naturally. I mean, it's not... It's not a natural thing to be able to read a P&L or a financial sheet on a daily basis. So what these companies do, open book management, they teach people how to read the financials. And so any given day, you can start to read the financials. So in the managing minds model, it's all open, including how the company is doing on any given day. And you can take it even further. Some of these companies let everybody, let everybody know what everybody else is making. Now, how many times in your life in any corporate environment have you ever turned to your coworker and said, how much do you make? Yeah, it's like, so rare, right? Well, it's it's so rare. It's almost, I haven't ever had it happen when okay. I worked at IBM, for example. Sure. I never said to anybody, I'm making X, what are you making? Sure. In these new model of companies, if everybody knows what everybody's making, it takes a level of competition out. And if you take a level of competition away, it only increases the level of cooperation. And the more cooperation there is, the more collaboration and the more communication. So the idea is to enable the sharing, enable the cooperation, enable the collaboration, rather than disable it, which is what the old model actually tries to do. Because when you disable that cooperation and communication, you basically enable control. Right. So it all kind of fits together. It all works together. Sure. So for people, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, and I just want to say that there are companies that we have in the book that have actually made the move. It's it's great fun to watch and study and talk to these companies. UKTV is a great example in Wales. Um, they had been a company that were was managing hands, okay. the old model. And there just wasn't enough innovation, there wasn't enough creativity, there wasn't enough going on, there wasn't enough collaboration. What they decided to do was they were on two floors, and so they took away the ceiling and they opened it up. And then they took away the corner offices for the managers. And then they took away everybody's individual desk. And what this forced people to do is to start to really talk to one another, to collaborate, to communicate. And so they, by changing the physical environment, they changed the culture. Okay. And one of the things that came out of that is that people started to learn what other people were doing. They started to share what they were learning. People were learning on their own more. They were providing more information to one another and more knowledge to one another. So these companies, by changing their management model, became learning became the focus of what these companies did. And that was what I meant by a long way around the barn to get to the door. The great companies that are great at learning are great because they've changed their model for managing. Sure. So how do you work with companies to actually get there and become a Minds at Work company? The first thing we have to do is find out who in the company believes that this is a good idea. Okay. It could be senior executives, it could be someone lower down in a division, it could be a team, for example. Because there's two ways for this to happen, it can be top down or bottom up, okay? Now, if it's top down, 
you you take the UK TV model. Darren Childs is the CEO. Okay. Darren Childs believed in the model. He believed in moving in this direction, and he said, "I'm going to make the changes." And he made the changes. Sure. If you take a look at another company like um, Zingerman's, for example, a lot of that started in the middle. Okay. There were people who believed that this was a the direction they wanted to go in, and the teams and the divisions started to have such a great success that the people at the top of the company looking at them said, well, wait a minute, they're doing something very differently than the rest of us, and we need to pay attention. So yeah, we try to figure out who do we want to work with? Do we want to work at the top? Do we want to work with a small team in the middle? Do we want to work with a bigger division? And we start to give them ideas for ways that they can move from command and control to collaborate and communicate. Some of it is very simple and straightforward. The way managers speak to their employees, for example, if you're in a managing hands environment and that's your model of management, and you hire somebody. I hire you, Kevin. You come to me on a Monday. You start working by Wednesday. You see it, something that you have a great idea for changing, and you say to me, Dave, I have this great idea how to change something to make it better. In a managing hands environment, as a manager, I'm going to say to you, Kevin, that's not your job. You haven't been here long enough. Forget it. Just go back and do what you're supposed to do. Sure. In a managing minds environment, I'm going to say to you, okay, let's sit down and talk about it. You could have a really great idea. You could have an idea that no one's had before because you're coming in fresh. Sure. So let's listen to what your idea is. And if I really like your idea, then I'm going to say to you, okay, let's figure out how we can try it. Sure. That's a big difference, but that's just the difference between how the manager is listening to you and how the manager is talking to you. No, I, I, so it's I, small things. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really good. And is like obviously your book kind of like Minds at Work, Managing for Success in the Knowledge Economy, you know, covers this stuff. But what else can people potentially do? Maybe if their company's not necessarily open to it, or maybe they don't even know that there's a different way to actually bring this into their company or that it even exists. One of the things, and I'm working with companies right now that are doing this. There are, there are, there's a tra I'll give you an example. There's a training manager in a company in North Carolina. It's a manufacturing company. Okay. And he was hired to do training. Okay. He read the book and he loved the idea and he thought if the company could move in this direction, it could be much more successful. But he called me up and he said, I don't know where to start. I don't have a clue. So what we do now is that we have a weekly phone call and he tells me a project he's working on. For example, he's been recently working on a project with 12 line managers teaching them how to help other people learn to do their job. Okay. And I said to him, okay, well, let's think about how instead of you being the sage on the stage and using the old model of pushing the education out to them, you give them a number of opportunities to learn and ask them to pull the education, to learn it on their own, and then get together every week to discuss it. So okay. it, it's the reverse of the model of we get together once a week and I'm just going to tell you and then you're going to go off and do it. But you're going to go off and learn it, get together every week, and you're going to talk to each other about what you learned and share it. So you start to have teams collaborating and communicating. That's just a very small thing, but it starts to change people's mindset about how we learn. One of the examples. No, I, I think that's really good, right? Because it, it's it's a lot easier and then other people will see that guy doing it and then maybe they bring it into their team and it just kind of snowballs from there, right? Right. Right. Small successes lead to larger successes and then the whole company starts to think about, well, what is it that they're doing right? Or what is it that they're doing better than we've ever done before? And they start to look and they realize, well, they're using a different management model. It's open. It's focused on people's minds. It's focused on what people can bring to work every day instead of the skills that we've given them to bring to work. It's sort of like in the old model, if you think about the manufacturing plant, you came to work with your lunch in a lunch pail. Sure. Well, if that model carries over, it's sort of like you come to work with your skills in your lunch pail as well, and that's all you bring. But that's not true because you, we know you bring a lot more. You bring all your experience, your thoughts, your feelings, your abilities, your intellect. In the new model, you bring yourself to work. You just don't bring this pail of stuff, okay? Yeah, interesting. And, 
And if you take advantage of that, what you suddenly find is that things move faster, better, more easy. Uh, it's more fun. People's level of happiness goes up. Their engagement goes up. It's a, it's a sea change for the people who move into this new model. No, I, I think that's that's really good. And, and it's actually quite interesting. But sadly, David, we're out of time. So let's close with mentioning where people can actually get the book and more information about yourself and Knowledge Star. And, you know, maybe they want to actually reach out to you to, to work with them through this whole thing. Sure. The, you can get the book on any of the online booksellers. And uh, it's Amazon, Nook, and all the rest of them. It's available right now. You can also buy it through ATD Press, which is our publisher. Sure. And you can reach me at david at knowledgestar.com. And I'm more than happy just to talk with you to find out if you like the idea and thoughts you might have. And if you want to engage me to help you move through this change, this transformation from one model to a new model, I'd love to work with you. Sure. And the book, again, is called Minds at Work, Managing for Success in the Knowledge Economy. Just Right. That's right, Kevin. Yeah, well, David, again, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Well, thanks, Kevin. You too. I appreciate right. it. Thanks. Take Bye. care.